So, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining the second Euro practice webinar on microfluidics. Uh, after the introduction session we had two weeks ago, we now start with more in-depth presentations related to the microfluidic breakdown parts that were touched upon last time. The one of today is about the bioassay transfer to the microfluidic scale, its opportunities and challenges, and will be presented by Dr. Luis Fernandez from Microliquid. This webinar is the second one in a list of five originally planned and advertised uh, webinars. However, we are pleased to announce that we have now the confirmation of a sixth webinar organized on July the 8th and which will be given by XFAP and will cover silicon-based microfluidics. Links for subscribing uh, will be made available through the Europractice mailing list and will also become available on our LinkedIn page soon. I'd like to repeat shortly our house rules to make this webinar enjoyable for all of us. So you're all muted from the start and I would like to ask you to remain muted during the whole session. Questions can be posed uh, through the chat channel, preferably during the webinar and will be answered to at the end. If you come up with more questions, you're free to contact me afterwards. Let me now introduce you to the presenter of today. Uh, Dr. Luis Fernandez is partner director and CTO of Microliquid and has 20 years of experience on microengineering and microfluid manufacturing. This includes in vitro diagnostic systems, drug delivery and tissue monitoring micro devices, cell culture microfluidic systems for organ on chip applications and biomaps. His research interests include both the generation of new scientific approaches to the impact uh, to impact the biomedical field, as well as finding industrial and clinical solutions of biomedical research. He is also co-founder and partner of Beyond Chip, a company dedicated to the development and commercialization of microfluidic devices for organ on chip applications. And he is partner of Ebers Medical Technology, not sure whether I pronounce this correct, a company dedicated to the development and commercialization of equipment for tissue engineering and organ transplantation. With this, we are ready to start for a long but hopefully instructive session. So, Louis, um, it's all up to you now. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure and honor to, to be here with you, uh, sharing uh, our knowledge on how to transfer a biosay successfully to a microfluidic uh, product. And this is exactly what we want to approach here. Um, the, the question is, what is actually industry looking for when they are approaching microfluidics? And actually, what they what we mean with that is that we want to integrate different operations, which are uh, commonly uh, performed by a laboratory, to integrate it into a single device, a single a single chip, for uh, many different applications like immune assays, molecular diagnostics, cell culture, and so on. There are conventionally issues, which has been already addressed for cartridge development, such as the, the use of uh, till now of non scalable materials, how to get material which can is com completely compatible with the bioassay, with the, with the protocol that we need to run, uh, the cartridges, uh, how to manufacture that in a, in, a, in a mass production way. But there are indeed difficulties which are not related to the microfluidic itself, but to the bioassay. So um, when we are facing the integration of a bioassay protocol within microfluidic device, uh, we need also to reduce uh, the complication of the of the bioassay, to reduce the time, to increase the the sensitivity, and to also to solve problems related with reagents storage and cell life of those of those reagents. So this is what I am going to um, address during the during the course of this uh, of this talk. I will divide the, the talk in three different parts. Uh, the first one would be uh, addressing the different uh, protocols and technologies which are being used in order to transfer a bioassay to a microfluidic device. That will be most of my presentation, like three quarters of it. Then I will try to address where exactly this bioassay transfer uh, is, uh, is within the whole process of developing a microfluidic based product how to do then how from the from the, the the defining the definition of the of the of what we want to achieve till down to the to the mass production of the product and reaching the market and then we will talk about a little bit about uh, what we will drive conclusions 
So let's start with the with the different technologies that are available for the transferring of a bioassay. So there are different applications. Uh, most uh, most important ones are diagnostics. Um, in, it requires a number of uh, technologies which are needs to be addressed, like sample preparation, reagents storage, fluid control, immunoassay integration, or DNA amplification, and finally detection. But there are also others like uh, cell culture related. Which, uh, some of them are organ on chip technologies or drug testing technologies or human identification applications. But I will address during this presentation diagnostics. I think it's the most important field. I need to go somewhere to introduce the technology, and I think that's the best the best choice to go. So I will address during the course of my presentation diagnostics. And in order to make it easier to follow, uh, I will not only just uh, go through the different technologies which are um, being used for diagnostics, but I will try to bring two different uh, examples. So during the course of my presentation, I will go through how would I, I will make choices like as an example purposes, of how could we implement uh, two different sensors based on microfluidics, one related with the detection of antibody related with COVID-19, and the other one is how to identify uh, RNA and material out of a sample. It is also very currently well, it's it's kind of a hot topic right now. So first, I, before I start, I want to introduce a couple of ideas in, in your mind. So first, transferring bioassay is not a direct task. It's not like I have a bioassay, I want to do exactly the same thing what I'm doing in the laboratory, I want to do it in the microfluidic device. That can work, but it cannot work as well. So it, this is not the, the, the mindset that we need to approach when we are developing microfluidic device. We need to take into account that we are changing the whole environment of the protocol and it might require changes. So it might require that you have a protocol which is working in your laboratory and needs some kind of tuning or change the technology in order to reach a successful product in the microfluidic device. And there are many different ways to establish an AVISA in microfluidics. It, it, doesn't mind, it doesn't mean when you are seeing a product in the market, it could be, could be done differently, of course, could be done differently. Uh, but, but there is always uh, a better way, which in terms of time consuming, uh, final cost. So you need to be aware of all different strategies to, take, to, to see at all different technologies which are available to understand them all, and then to select the ones which are specifically matching best this uh, application of, of use and there is no best technology overall so it's not like you need to go through immunosay which is a, a, an indirect uh, indirect way or a direct way or, or competitive it's always related to both the bioassay and also the microfluidic environment so i will go through the course of this uh, presentation i will some some of them more deeply i will try to summarize as much as possible I will just scratch the surface and see you some uh, some examples, but please take into account that these are some just examples and many different choices might be also uh, applied. So let's start from, from diagnostics. So the first thing to do is sample prep. So, first, so when we are going to do the detection of something, uh, the, the first thing of course to do is we need to sample. sample, sample which contains what we want to detect. And there are many different samples very different natures, uh, which is heterogeneous, uh, with different kind of um, materials and molecules are present. And we need to understand this exactly uh, inside of the different uh, nature, what are the different natures of samples. And then, of course, to uh, com uh, completely identify which is the target that we need to extract from the sample, and then to, to perform the different protocols in order to get it from this, uh, the sample that we, that we already uh, selected. There are different fields which are very challenging because of the heterogeneity of the of the sample. So when you work for molecular diagnostics, uh, when you want to target RNA or DNA, uh, it's not just this target which is involved in within the sample. There are many different um, species or uh, molecules which are also in integrated into the sample, and you need to do uh, things to to uh, extract exactly uh, specifically that target of interest. And this microfluidics bringing into the sample prep preparation, so it will allow you the automatization of the automation of the of the whole protocol if it's uh, required, but also uh, the reagents amount because we are for microfluidics, the reagents amount that you will require in order to perform this task of extracting the specific target that you want to select 
are, are reduced and the manipulation uh, is not required you could, uh, because you've got to automatize that and and you could you know, of course then you can also increase the reproducibility of the task so um when you are working on on sample prep there are many different technologies that you can apply and then uh, you have a sample and then you can just use just chemicals for instance to digest uh the for instance a cell in order to reach the you can use chemicals in order to breach the membrane and then make the DNA or RNA accessible. You can use the same thing with my mechanical means, uh, mechanical uh, application of the sample and then uh, breaking up uh, the fungi or the cells or the bacteria that you want to reach. You can also use ultrasounds in order to get it or magnetic bits. Magnetic bits is, uh, are tiny, small uh, magnetic particles with some magnetic properties and the other few micrometers in diameter, which are functionalized in order to specifically catch the target which is inside of your sample. Uh, and then making use of permanent magnets, you can uh, specifically track these specific uh, targets that you want to, to, to work with. Also, you can use silicon membranes where your sample goes through and then directly catches what your target of interest or you can use a fractionation of the whole blood in case of the, the blood is, is, is your sample in order to, again, uh, take, pick up your, your, your target of interest or generate droplets. Generate droplets with the, which are catching specifically your, your targets and also, also generating inside of the droplet the different reagents uh, in order to perform the reaction. So when you are working with sample prep, first is uh, identified what you want to to detect what is exactly your targets it could be a protein it could be nucleic acids if, uh, then select uh, take into account the heterogeneity of the sample that you are going to work with uh, is it uh, is it clean enough or are there uh, big cells or big more just or is all just composed of small molecules and then take into account that and then when you are looking at it then you need to run a general protocol which is taking care of all the different natures of your of your sample. Maybe you need to say collect it in a specific way, or you need to pre-concentrate it because it's very much diluted, or you need to store it. It might be that you also need to, to amplify it, or you need to clean it up or purify it or elute. You, you need to run a specific generic protocol, which is being to carry out to be carried out into microfluidic device. So let's go for the examples. Uh, let's start with that. So how are we going to approach uh, an antibody detection? Uh, um, as you know, when you are with COVID-19, you, 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 your body generates antibodies in order to trap the, the virus. And this is exactly what we are going to, to be looking for, the, the antibodies which could be present into the, into the human sample, uh, as, which is relating with the course of the, of the presence of the virus into the patient. And first is okay. Let's let's. What are we going to to target? Is the protein? Is the protein which is generated by the human when the, vi when the virus is present into the into the patient? Um, we can then select the sample. It could be different one. Let's start with blood. So we will use a blood sample and then we run a protocol. So a protocol that we uh, can select as an example is what we we we'll collect the sample. We will store it in a microfluid device in order to perform the the assay. And then we will do the protein isolation. So we will catch the, the protein exactly from the general sample of the blood. So that would be within the list I just described before, it would be the whole blood fractionation uh, methods. Why again, why way to, I don't know what it, uh, okay. So one way to, to do this is to use capillary methods. So there are uh, capillary tubes which are available, uh, which uh, in direct contacts of a droplet of blood, they collect a specific volume of, of blood and integrate it into the, into the tube. That could be easily also integrated into the microfluidic device and it integrates, therefore, the sample into the cartridge. Uh, it, there are many different things which I mean, they mean needs to be taken into account, how to integrate that successfully, how to be an hermetic input, how to avoid any bubble formation, but these are all uh, technological uh, approaches which can be completely solved. And then if we move to RNA, um, when, when the target would be, well, of course, we want to viral nucleic acid detection of the, so here what we want to, to um, detect is the RNA material, which is inside of the virus. So we are going to 
catch or to detect the virus itself. So our target would be viral nucleic acids. Um, and the sample that we can select, for instance, is uh, a swab or a nasopharyngeal washes. Um, so that would be our sample, which is a completely different nature than, than blood. And then because we want to collect RNA, which is inside of a virus, that would be then more uh, complex, complete uh, general protocol that we need to carry out. We need to collect the sample, but when we also need to store it, we need to resolve the sample in order to get access to the nucleic acid. We need to digest, again, the, the sample in order to cut it into pieces, then transfer that into the microfluid device, and then amplify that, uh, and use many bits in order to, to trap it into the microfluidic device and clean it up and, and, and being concentrated. So that would be our selection for, for RNA detection. Magnetic bits. So how would that work uh, in, a, in a protocol base? So we will have uh, a, a swab in order to collect the sample, and then we will mix it with a solution solution in order to, or, or to get an homogeneous distribution of the sample within a, a liquid. We will then mix it with a, a lysine buffer in order to, make, to break the membrane of the virus and make the RNA successful, uh, accessible. And then magnetic bits will be present uh, which have been functionalized in order to catch any RNA uh, material which is into the sample. Therefore, we can integrate this mixture into the microfluidic device and then with the help of a magnet, while the sample is going through, the, the sample material, the RNA material already uh, isolated, will be cut and contained within a microfluidic chamber where we will be able to work with it afterwards for the detection of the RNA. So let's move now to the different technology that we will need for next, which is the reagent. So we have the sample now, we have the targets, and now we need the different reagents in order to work the biosay that we need to carry on with the microfluidic device. Um, what is the reagent? So it's just the different substances of compounds which are required in order to run a biological protocol, which is, uh, which is going to be used for the detection. Um, there are different challenges like the volumes which are uh, in, within microfluidic devices, which are small volumes that need to be the, um, controlled. They need to be stable because the, you want them to be integrated into the, uh, into the device, but also need to be stable during the course of time. And you want them, of course, integrated because otherwise you will need uh, different uh, bottles or different stuff around your chip, which you want to avoid as much as possible. So how is microfluidic bringing in a solution to that? Uh, it will it, the the use of um, of uh, microfluidics allows you to do make to make use of different methods, like uh, which is drying the samples and then increasing the stability of these reagents, and then of course you also need to you can also have the 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 capability to integrate the liquid the different liquids and the different or, uh, or dry reagents within the microfluid device which is making a, a more simplistic way to perform the, the assay. There are mainly three, mainly three ways of integrating reagents into microfluid devices. It's a wet, freeze drying, and dry down, and we will go through uh, all three because they, we will use them into our into samples. So let's start with the antibody detection, in which case we can make use of both wet and, and dry down. And so we'll, let's start with the dry down one. So the dry down one, uh, one, one of the most clear examples is the use of microarrays. What is a microarray? Microarray is an array of different spots, which includes uh, a specific uh, molecules, which are being uh, designed in order to trap our targets. And what is a spot is exactly that. It's just a, a, a circle within a diameter in the order of 50 and 150 micrometers containing many copies of the molecule that we have designed in order to trap our targets. So when we are going to use it for, for our example, then what we need to do is to, as you see on the, on the right, you see a chamber where we have deposited by pipe, by uh, automatic pipating, um, specific volumes of the molecules that we want to, uh, to uh, trap into the surface, so that will be then ready to catch the, uh, the antibody present into the, into the sample. The way to do it, we first deposit it in liquid form, and then under specific conditions and a specific um, temperature and, and humidity conditions, you are able to dry them down and to put them present, as you see on the bottom on the bottom right. So that when the sample goes through it, 
you will be able to catch specifically this antibody if it's present into the into the sample. And then we will also make use of wet reagents. Uh, in many cases, you will need reagents to form in order to do the specific labeling or cleaning processes. Uh, you can run them using tubes, bottles, syringes, or vials, which are integrated into the point of care system. But uh, it will be externally connected. Uh, the volume storage could be used for its high, so you can use them for several tests, and they are easy to develop. However, uh, this approach uh, gets you to regular maintenance requirements into the point of care system, and then a high risk for, for failure due to uh, also contamination. So in our case, we are going to make an example where we don't make use of this, but we make use of blisters. The blisters are specific containers, uh, mainly um, made of out of aluminum foil, where they store it, uh, specific amounts of liquids, which are required within the course of the of the project of the of the of the microfluidic protocol. So that allow an, allows to have a storage of the of the of the liquids, which is hermetically closed, and then exactly it's um, opened right at the moment, which is required in order to run the bioassay. So the point of care system opens up the um, blister in order to get the liquid available at a specific moment. So, and the other one uh, which is left is freeze dry. So what is uh, freeze drying is, is just a different way to remove the completely the water which is uh, present into the into this reagent by you making use of low temperatures. So by controlling temperature and pressure, you are able to, to go from uh, a solid state from freezing up the the freezing down the the, the reagent up to a gas state without going through the liquids, which then uh, includes uh, in this case what you what you get is advantages in terms of um, stability, better stability of the of the reagent. This kind of uh, how this is implemented into the into the microfluidic cartridge, which is complex. So we mainly make use of specific vessels, which integrates the specific life lines reagents that you want to achieve so that then you can reduce the cost of the lyophilization process as the vessels are much smaller than the complete system. And then you just need also to integrate these small vessels into the point microfluidic cartridge, what it's uh, specifically designed to be for running the for running the protocol. There are many different advantages for the using of uh, freeze drying, or even though it's more expensive than the conventional dry down. But as I mentioned before, it's uh, most is the the higher stability of the reagents, which have been uh, which is performed when with the freeze drying protocol, and also the capability of integrating several different combinations of uh, biochemical components within a single chamber, um, in a single in a single shot. Okay, so we have our targets. We have our reagents in order to write to go through the through the protocol, and that's we will need now fluidic control in order to make the, the fluidic protocol within our, our microfluidic device. So the first, the concept is how are we going to get the manipulation of the fluids in the microscale uh, environment? So there are many different ways to achieve that. Let's go through uh, some, uh, some examples. So first is capillary or uh, even gravity forces. Uh, the capillary would be like the, the capillary tube that I mentioned before that we were, as an example, how to integrate blood into the microfluidic device or so make use of um, hydrophilicity surfaces in order to drag your sample uh, inside of your inside of microfluidic device. It could be also they make you could also make use of uh, syringe pumps. You can make use of pumps for in order to create vacuum at your outlet and then therefore drag your your liquids through the through the micro channels. You can also make use of peristaltic pumps, which is not more than just a rotor which is applied into flexible tube. In order to make a, a, a displacement of the of the liquids, pressure controllers, which is just uh, the control of the pressure, the air pressure, which is inside of the in a specific con compartment of the chip, and then by applying an extra pressure of the uh, air pressure into this reservoir, the liquid gets uh, pumped in into the into the chip, or even integrate microfluidic valves uh, into the into the chip in order to get them. Uh, a constant flow through the through the through the chip. 
And of course, there are many other different components that you can externally uh, plug into your into your system, like piston pumps, membrane pumps, piezoelectric pumps. They all give a different uh, different profile, and they are all good. It's just to make the right choices for the specific uh, bias that you want to perform. The challenges are that um, you always need to work with small volumes. Uh, flow rates also are very very big, very small. So they're also very difficult to target in microfluidics. Uh, also, the heterogeneity of, of, of the reagents, uh, some samples are very viscous and they are also uh, not suitable for certain applications or for certain technologies for uh, uh, pump controlling. And you always need to track these liquids inside of a small channels which integrates a fluidic resistance, which is not always easy to, to accept. So microfluidics allows you to design uh, in a low cost way the different strategies for the fluidic control. And it, it allows you also to reduce of the, of the tolerances on the small systems which are, which are required. So with all the different options that are available for fluidic control, for our case in antibiotics, so let's take, for instance, aspiration. How we would implement that into a microfluidic device? So you see now on the top right, we have a, a microfluidic device where we already integrated our, our your capillary tube for our integration on top, integration of the whole uh, blood. We have these two blisters on the, on the left, which are the reagents that we will require. And we have the dry, the, the dry, and, the dry reagent right in the chamber. If you see at the bottom right, or the, we are already deposited our antigen. So first, what we would do is we would apply a negative pressure in our outlet, which is at the right of the chip, that's P2, so that we will drag the sample within our chamber of interest, where we have our antigen. And there, what we would do next is to apply a pressure in one of our, our blisters, so that a secondary uh, antibody, it's going through the chamber again, which has been labeled, and then it's specifically designed to be attracted to a different part of the antibody, which is successful. Accessible at the at the chamber. Finally, we will use the second blister in order to build substrate, which will react with the label that we have applied to the second antibody in order to perform our final our our final detection. So that would be uh, an example way in order to integrate uh, with the control into the microfluidic device. And then let's move now to, to the pneumatic uh, approach that we will apply to the RNA detection of the of the virus. And then you will have a different option for the chip, where you will have a, on the top left, you have a, an inlet uh, where we will apply our, our sample. Uh, as you see that there will be, um, it's a cabinet where we will apply from the point of care system, a controlled pressurized air connection and making, uh, applying a higher pressure of air, we will drag or go through, uh, apply the, the liquid through the channel to get into the PCR chamber, where we will want to to, um, to address our targets, we insert the sample into the piece into the into the chamber, and then we will also apply it to different valves on both sides of the of the chamber, which are in this case membrane based, flexible membrane based. Um, we will make use of mag uh, magnets in order to trap the magnetic particles that we have been used for the for the collection of our targets. And we will run our amplification protocol, which is based on the use of thermocycline. Because we are going to use thermocycline and that will increase the pressure within the, mic the micro chamber. And that's the reason why we will need these two bulbs, which are both sides of the, of the chamber in order to uh, avoid that the same liquid, which is pressing into the chamber, will get out of the chamber into the thermocycling process. So let's let's move now into the mono immunoassays that uh, could be performed into a, a microfluidic device. The different options that we have. A, a immunoassay is a, by definition uh, uh, an interaction between uh, two different molecules, the antigen and the antibody, in order to trap and uh, and a specific target it could be the antigen or the antibody, or, no, it could be both. And uh, so one of them. And the challenging applications for immunoassay are not only clinical diagnostics, but also biopharmaceutical analysis, environmental monitoring, security, or food testing, for instance. 
what is microfluidic bringing, bringing as a solution is that because we are targeting the connection between two different molecules, the, the enhanced the surface to volume ratio then enhance also the, the possibilities for these two molecules to meet. And that therefore reduces the time required in order to perform this specific uh, binding. Uh, it also allows the monitorization of the whole uh, system and increase the stability through the reagent format that we already addressed before. So there are different ways of performing immunosay, like direct, indirect, competitive, and, and sandwich are the main ones. Uh, we will address the indirect one uh, by our antibody detection example. So first, um, what we will have is, as we described before, we will have our, our antigen in the substrate. And we want to, as we mentioned before, we want to attract our target, which is an antibody. So this antibody will get dragged into the into the substrate and will be we trapped by it. And then the second antibody, which was labeled and applied to the into the blister, if you remember before, uh, that was uh, that could that would be the method of detection for the presence of our antibody. That which what is considered to be the indirect way of performing an immunoassay. But it's not the only one, that it's uh, a different ways to do this kind of immunoassays um, um, detections, uh, depending of course of if you want to detect the an antibody or you want to detect the antigen. Uh, and they are different, it's not like it's one best, uh, uh, one, one is better than the other one, is that you need to reflect what your biosay is, uh, what is your microfluidic environment, and then select the one that is better for your specific application. Let's move now to the DNA amplification technology. Um, DNA uh, amplification are, is mainly due, uh, performed by PCR, uh, which is a method in order to uh, multiply the fragments of DNA present into the sample. They require, this technique requires different reagents to be installed into the, into the microfluidic device. First, of course, you need the sample, but you also mean, need different uh, molecules such as the, the buffer mix in order to enhance the, the reaction. You need, of course, the nucleotides, which are required in order to, um, to fabricate or manufacture again this DNA sample to, in order to amplify it. You need primers, which specifically binds to specific locations of the DNA that you want to amplify so that you are sure that you are only amplifying the, the DNA fragments that you want to be to, to check whether or not is present into your sample. And then the, you also need, require the polymerase, which is uh, starting this, re this reaction. So you need to mix all these things, uh, biological uh, molecules into a, a liquid and then perform the, the protocol. How is this protocol? So first, uh, as I mentioned before, it's, um, it's a thermocycling protocol. So it's requiring the changes of temperature. At the beginning, the sample is there. You see double st uh, strain DNA coupled together, and then you increase the temperature in order to detach this uh, double strain of, of DNA. Then by reducing the temperature, the primer is allowed to go through these specific spots, which have been designed to be uh, uh, targeting a specific uh, parts of the DNA you want to, to, tar to, to detect and only if the primers are finding exactly the complementary of, uh, of their design, they will be able to be trapped into the DNA. And then the polymerase uh, reaction starts and then integrates and starts filling the rest of the strain uh, by making use of the uh, oligonucleotides which are present into the, into the mixture. And then by repeating this several times, you will have an exponential growth of the specific parts of the DNA which have been designed to be uh, amplified. So there are many different parameters which are challenging for PCR detection, for PCR amplification. First, of course, is the design of the primers. They need to be specifically designed so that they are only binding to specific parts which are only present into your target and not into any, any, any DNA or the material which is present, might be present into your sample so that you have a specificity. Uh, and it also needs to be uh, reproducible and increase the, it has to be very stable so that the, all these different molecules need to be stored in a way that they are able to be um, 
working at different for different times. And what's bringing microfluidics? It's because of the make, nature of microfluidics, we will make use of small volumes of liquids, which then reduces the time at which you will require in order to heat up and cool down your 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 reaction. Because of the volume is, is reduced, so then the the thermal inertia inertia of the of the protocol will be lower, and then you will be able to reduce the time. Also, again, because of the small volumes involved all the reagents that you require will be reduced and then you would, would be that will reduce the overall cost of your of your of your assay so there are many different ways to perform the the PCI protocol but we will select uh, the the one uh, just retroactive test PCR in order to perform the change the phase between RNA to DNA and then multiplex PCR in order to integrate controls so let's look how that would be so we have our micro uh, our uh, magnetic particles with the RNA coming from the sample, and we have isolated that into the microfluidic chamber. So now we have available our RNA that we want to, to to amplify. We will need to mix that with two different RNA samples. One is a house a housekeeping human uh, a human housekeeping gen, uh, which is always present into uh, human material. So a human sample, and this is just to make sure that the sample was collected properly. And then you will also introduce RNA internal control, so just pieces of RNA, which are, will be always uh, amplified by the by the primers. So just to make sure, a uh, specific primer, so that to make sure that the thermocycling protocol was running correctly. So once we have mixed that, we will you make use of the record transcriptation just to translate RNA material into DNA. And then once we have the DNA string, we will run the protocol that I just described in order to amplify that and then get uh, multiple copies of them so that we'll be able to be detected afterwards. And that goes to the final stage of the, of the microassay, which is the detection. So there are many different ways of performing a detection. The detection is just a way to, uh, a trans, uh, to integrate a transducer. We have performed the detection of something and we want to carry on a signal, which is uh, easily uh, uh, read by a point of care system. Uh, main, uh, main way, the, main, the most effective ways to do that are making use of fluorescent molecules, which are molecules which are uh, capable of emit a specific light of a specific wavelengths once have been um, um, has been in person of a also a specific uh, lights from the point of curve system um, also a radius of chemical species which are uh, chemicals which are able to produce changes of the of the co in color or voltage signals or chemiluminescent reagents which are able to uh, emits uh, lights when the when when the reaction is taking care, is taking place. The challenges here are that um, they are mainly involved uh, sophisticated instruments. Uh, when you are making use of these transducers, um, they also require a high number of, of manual steps, and the detection methods are always uh, time-consuming and requiring expensive reagents. So what microfluidics can really uh, bring into the table as the simplification of these uh, sensitive uh, instruments to integrate, uh, to provide a full automation of the, of the contracts and then to reduce the size of the, of the devices. So let's go through our examples and then from the different uh, ways to detect, let's pick as an example colorimetric for the antibody detection and let's see how that would be. So uh, as uh, as you remember, we, we want to uh, detect as the are the the antibodies. So we will have our antigen located as a uh, with a dry as a dry reagent into our substrate. We will integrate then the sample and the secondary label antibody, antibody which integrates an HRP uh, molecule, which is known to be generating to, to generate color in presence of a specific uh, liquid substrate. So then in the end, what you will have is a, a probability by optical means to check whether or not that's positive by checking whether or not there was color at the specific locations where the the antigen was located by the dry by the dry down uh, method. And let's go now 
what we would do, what we could do into the RNA detection and let's pick fluorescence for this case. So there are two ways to perform fluorescence detection into, into a PCR. One is the real-time, what is called real-time PCR. Uh, and uh, again, different ways to integrate that. One is to integrate uh, non-specific fluorescence intercalation dye. So that's uh, specific molecules which uh, specifically bind to PCR, also, sorry, to free DNA fragments which are present into the sample. Or you could also make use of what's called beacon probes, which are molecules which are integrated in both a fluorophore, but also a quencher, which is trapping all the light coming from the fluorophore. And then uh, that's this, this binding between the two are made by a primer, which is specifically fits with the DNA which uh, fragment, which is uh, going to be detected. And only by the presence of many copies of them, this primer, this probe uh, sequence will bind into the DNA and detach the fluorophore from the quencher so that the fluorophore light is available uh, from the outside and we not able to be detected. Or what is called the Tagman probes, which could be, for example, the one of choice for, for these applications. A Tagman probes is a molecule which, uh, again, uh, puts together a fluorophore and a quencher and again could be applied again into the uh, matches directly into the DNA of, of uh, that we want to detect if it's amplified and then the polymerase change reaction one is goes through it it breaks this this molecule and then the fluorophore again is, is free so that the light coming uh, out of this molecule is available for the optical detection by the point of care system and then you could also not uh, there are not, or not only you can do the detection by the PCR uh, sorry about the real-time PCR but also by DNA microarrays so that is that we could also integrate probes which are specifically binding to the uh, DNA material which has been amplified by the PCR and then labeling these specific molecules with fluorescent uh, DNA um, um, probes or we could also again make use of molecules which are uh, providing a specific color when in contact with a specific substrate or molecules which are emitting lights when in contact with say, the same substrate with different substrate or uh, providing a different changes in the in the voltage and the current by the redox um, protocol all these are different ways of performing uh, um, a detection and it's not like there is one best is just one which is better for the specific any specific application that you may you may require you just what is important is you know them all and you know what is the advantages and disadvantages so that you can select and pick one one which is best for your specific applications so let's sum up so summarize um the whole protocol so what we have chosen for the antibody detection for instance and then let's go through the whole protocol so we have this uh, tip as an example where we will first integrate our sample, uh, which is a whole blood, into the microfluid device, making making uh, use of uh, capillary tubes. We will have uh, weight reagents, uh, which will include the, the secondary uh, antibody, which is labeled, and the substrate in order to perform the detection. And we have in a specific chamber, which has integrated the dry reagents in order to trap the antibodies. Now, making use of aspiration, we could then uh, make uh, uh, integrate the sample and then the second antibody and the substrate in order to perform the, the specific bioassay and then finally yeah, detect by optical means uh, the, the color of the of the bioassay of uh, our our reaction. Or, and then let's summarize what we did for the for the RNA uh, detection. And that is with the, the example of the chip that we will have, where we will integrate first the magnetic bits with the which already integrates the RNA from the sample preparation. We have in a specific chamber which already integrates lyophilized all the reagents required for the PCR amplification that we discussed before. And we will have this uh, really uh, these two um, mic micro bulbs in, in order to make sure that these, the, the reaction takes place without spreading the, the liquid through the, through the chip. And also we make use of um, air pressure control in order to drag the sample into the, into the chamber. We will run the DNA amplification by thermocycling and then we will make, and make use of Tagman probes in order to perform an optical detection. So these are uh, examples of the biocide. Let's move to the second part of the of the of the talk, 
where we are going to talk, discuss about how are these integrated into the final course, into the normal course of uh, product development. So when you are running a product development in microfluidics, first you need to do as a product definition and concept uh, um, phase, where you just uh, stating what are the proof of concepts, stating what is the biocide that you want to carry on and to perform a specific test in order to develop it. Then you need to run into the design and development phase where this, uh, you different specific um, um, samples or uh, sorry, um, devices are being manufactured and integrated into a final product. So you have a final product which has been developed during the course of the, of the project. These products needs, the, needs to go to the next phase, which is a, a, new, uh, a new product introduction. So make sure that it's completely validated and it's compatible with the manufacturing um, processes so that you can then run a mass manufacturing phase where it's in, into the, into, in order to reach mass production and reach successfully the market. So the biocide transfer is exactly at, this is at the beginning of the phase when you are doing the product definition and, and concept and also the product design and development. At the, at the beginning of, the, of, the, of this uh, phase, what you need to do, at the, uh, of course, is first to get the benchmark validation. So the, the customer um, has already implemented a protocol which is running into the laboratories and we, 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 you need to study that very well, make sure that well at the, all the different steps which are required, install it, into the into the into the facilities where you are going to do this transfer from the biose into the microfluidic device, and it's, and work in, in the combined manner between the engineers and the and the biologists and, and the biochemists to make sure that the transfer from the laboratory is successful within the microfluidic device, taking into account all the concepts and all the protocol designs from the microfluidic point of view. So you you uh, design specific prototypes, which are just single modules, different differentiated, the single, te the simple, single technologies that we just went through at the beginning, just making proof of concepts that they, they run successfully, and then you integrate them together into, um, into a final prototype, a product development, which will be then transferred into new product, a new product introduction, and then uh, mass, for, uh, uh, mass production facilities in order to successfully achieve the market. And as a one, the main conclusion of the talk is that in order to run successfully a transfer of the bioassay into the microfluidic device, it's not just that you want to target what is the microfluidic uh, engineering of the protocol, but you need to have an overall knowledge of biology and biochemistry, all the different technologies which are, which are available, integrated into the um, development team to make sure that you make the right choices so that you know take into account just the protocol and run ex exactly the protocol that you have developed in your laboratory but you also take into account everything which is um, bringing from the microfluidic world perspective and to make sure that the time and the cost of the final products that you have developed is reduced as much as possible um, we have that very clear at, in, in microliquids. We have uh, facilities, not only for the clean room facilities for the manufacturing of the microfluid devices, but we have specific facilities for a bio laboratory so that will allow us always to uh, bring every uh, laboratory protocol which is coming from our clients in order to install it into our facilities, to work with it, to, and then to transfer, to, to integrate it as a benchmark, and then to transfer that step by step, making sure that you are making things right and making the right choices within the microfluidic environment. And with that, uh, I will finish my, my talk. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Louis. It was a fascinating presentation. Uh, it is clearly a complex matter, but you managed to explain it in a very uh, clear and structured way, uh, which makes it uh, understandable and insightful for non-experts. Um, so I have one question uh, so far. Um, it says, assuming localized surface functionalization of biosensor chips, what resolution can you offer? Uh, how closely spaced trend users can you functionalize on a chip with an array of sensors? Well, it's, it's more or less what I explained before in the, in the microarray um, uh, section. 
Uh, mostly what you can functionalize are uh, dimensions in the, in the area or in the order of a few tens of micrometers between 20, 30, 50 micrometers uh, and above. And then you can specifically deposit uh, different liquids with different molecules uh, on, this, on these locations. So these are the most uh, used ways to perform functionalization of, of uh, surfaces. You refer to the spot sizes that you mentioned earlier then? Yeah, yes. okay, great. Um, yes, there are a few practical questions still, but I will answer that uh, by mail. Um, then one more question maybe. Um, for future development of new applications, where do you see the, the highest need for more research or more knowledge? Is it in the sample prep, the reagents uh, part or in the detecting uh, phase? Uh, do you have a view on that or is it all equally important? Well, it, they are equally important. Well, the thing is, some of them might be done externally and that's, that's uh, well, the, 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 the the case of urgency, it's different. Um, it's just the case of the specific market that you want to achieve. Uh, for instance, sample preparation is a key, is of key importance in order to make a successful microfluidic product. But it's always true that you can do perform that specific part outside of the microfluidic device. Now, in some cases, it doesn't really make sense and you need to integrate them. But in some cases, you, you can do it. Rather than uh, other specific cases like uh, some uh, reagent integration, it's all my, it's always a need. So you always need to integrate these, these reagents which are required for the bioassay into the microfluidic device. And that is of key importance and that's where more new technology needs to be um, developed. Um, right now we have a number of uh, solutions in order to get it done and there are a number of products that we are and others are manufacturing, but there are always, there will always be a need for, for that specific uh, technology. Okay, thank you. Um, if one more question uh, popping up. Just a second. Um, could you, it's a very specific question. Uh, do you have an example of any wound healing um, applications or solutions? Wound healing? Wound, wound healing? Um, How is that? Yeah, that, well, for wound healing, that's the organ and chip uh, kind of uh, application when you have cell cultures. Um, for microfluidic devices, what we they usually make use are microfluidic devices where you integrate cells and you generate a mono layer. It could be a complex 3D and 2D or, or whatever. And then you have performing a scratch um, uh, so that the cells are removed from a specific location and then you let the rest of the cells to cover that specific area. Uh, there are specific uh, chips in order to perform that. You allow, or it, which can be used differently. You allow the user in order to scratch the surface manually, or you can also allow uh, the user to apply a different specific voltages to uh, detach the specific cells from specific locations, and then allow the different cells to check and then to study well, how would be how the cells are uh, growing again in order to fill the. The, the 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 area which has been removed. Um, that's the specific devices I know uh, about Bohemian. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And then uh, one last question, maybe. Um, what are the technical challenges of doing every step in a chip? You mentioned sample preparation was made outside the chip. Although also mentioned these blister solutions, uh, but how about doing everything in an integrated platform? Yeah, yeah that, that's totally right. So um, I made the example, make it taking uh, sample preparation outside just for the sake of, of clarity of the presentation. Yes. Uh, but of course, you can, uh, you can, of course, integrate that and we have already a number of, of examples we have, what we have performed that. I mean, you make use of blisters in order to integrate the different reagents as just describe them to be in tubes. You describe, you can integrate them into the blisters and make use of 3D control in order to pass through the specific chamber step by step. Um, exactly. You can, of course, integrate that into the microfluidic device. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, once more, thank you very much. It was also very nice that you um, 
showed these very um, practical examples of the, the current COVID um, analysis that we are all uh, waiting for. Uh, so uh, thank you very much, very well done. And um, yeah, uh, for the rest of the audience, um, I hope to meet you again in two weeks from now when we will have the uh, third webinar in this series related to the microfluidics fabrication, in particular in uh, glass. So hope to meet you again in two weeks. Have a nice day. Thank you. Have a nice day. Bye bye. Bye bye.